think my name uh, is coming under my son's name. That's probably his login. I don't know if I can change it now. <laughs> you can change it. No uh, I'll try rename. Okay, we'll be starting. Yep. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first edition on, of IGO on Air. And we have today with us uh, Dr. Raju Vaish, Dr. Praveen Sarada, and Dr. Rohit. Uh, we'll be beginning with this uh, lecture by Dr. Lanit Mani on how to formulate a research question. And uh, uh, after that, Dr. Praveen will be doing his presentation on the same topic. We'll have a short discussion after that, and if we have any questions, we'll take it. So let's begin with the video of Dr. Manny. He couldn't be here because he is very busy in the hospital that is dealing with a lot of COVID cases, but he was kind enough to record the lecture with us. So let's begin with that. everybody and uh, welcome to this first lecture of auto school uh, related to orthopedic research and uh, this is a venture between Indian General of Orthopedics, IOA and Auto TV and we are together here to train the generation of orthopedic surgeons in terms of publication, writing manuscript and research ethics all together. So today we have with us uh, the editor of Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Dr. Nalit Maini. Uh, he is a well known in research circle and has published uh, many peer reviewed articles. He works as a professor in Molana Medical College, Delhi. And uh, we are very glad to have you, sir, on this uh, first Auto School lecture. Welcome to you, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this platform. And uh, hello to all of you who are on this research uh, webinar. Now, we are starting with uh, the first topic, which is how to generate a research question. Uh, this has been a, a very, very important starting point because any researcher at the end of the day wants his research to be utilized either for healthcare delivery or maybe other parts of his uh, facets of uh, personality, maybe uh, for career progression and ultimately getting it for them. So what is, a, what is the biggest disaster when you send an article for publication and it comes back with a reject? And the comment is that there is no new message coming out of it. So we always wonder what's gone wrong at an excellent research and it's been written in the right way and it has followed the instructions of the journals and still I get a negative response and it says that there is nothing new. So it all, it all uh, happens when you start it. So that is why it is very important to focus on what research you're doing and what is the research question. So if you start right, and how do you start right actually is that all the research questions are, at the end of the day, generated from a problem which you're facing during your clinical practice. And if it is to find a solution to that problem, it is always a new knowledge added to literature. You don't have to worry about it. So we are fortunate that over the years, uh, the scientific writing methodology has become structured. And if we follow certain rules, uh, we would be more useful to contributing to this literature. So let's get on to this topic, how to generate a research question. Now, if you look at the old scientific method, you formulate a hypothesis, you accumulate data, do an extensive experimentation, and finally publish. The world is changing now. This new method is probably formulate a hypothesis patented and earn millions out of it. So a research question is something you want to know about your discipline or about the specific area within your discipline. Not a topic, fragment, phrase, or sentence. It ends with a question mark. 
the question is clear and precisely stated it is not too broad or is not too narrow that it gets answered in a yes or a no black the post to closed meaning it cannot So identifying a reserve, if I have one, I'm very lucky. I do a review literature. I find out what is the gap in knowledge regarding that particular area of research which you want to do. But if I don't have a research question, narrow down to a research topic. This is when you do a training program and you're faced to do a thesis, which is probably your first research that you do. So what happens? You end up in a unit or with a consultant who does acetabular fractures or who does hip reconstruction so you know that your area of research is going to be around problems of the hip so if being in a in a unit where there is hip surgery going on and you think of a research question related to spine probably it is not going to be addressed so you narrow down your broad topic of research and then you try to review literature and find out what are the gaps in the work which you're already doing. Or if you're very lucky, maybe you join a unit which is already looking into certain problems in the patient care. For example, maybe there is a debate going on in the unit that whether we should address delayed presentation in fracture as tableau or they should not be operated and do a later on arthroplasty, which might be of a better outcome. So there is already a debate going on regarding a problem because being a tertiary level hospital and you're getting a reference from all around the country, the patients might be reaching you late. So is it wise to jump into a fracture establum, which is say eight weeks old with multiple, of pro multiple problems and a probability of a poor outcome or is it a wise option to maybe hold on to it for another four weeks achieve whatever malunion you can and do a, a primary arthroplast so this could be a, an example into when you have narrowed to a topic and you've done a review of literature in the review of literature in this particular point we are trying to look at the ideal times of doing surgery and is there literature available supporting or refuting surgery or suggesting arthroplasty in a primary situation so next once you come down you need to look into whether whatever question you're trying to frame is viable is original is feasible and are the economics related to it possible you might be planning that you start doing early arthroplasty in neglected established fracture, but due to, the, due to the economic model, either related to the institute or to the patient, there might not be a possibility of doing arthroplasty at all. So the research question will not go ahead. So once all these criteria are fulfilled, congratulations, you have a research question. So let's go to uh, this particular topic in a bit more detail. Let's look at another example. Start with a general topic such as media violence. Oh, it appears and sounds pretty broad. Browse a few journal books or ideas, and what you read is you read about children, adolescents, and media violence, a critical look. You look at encyclopedia of children and adolescents and the media. So you get literature talking about children and violence and probably there might be some connect of a large media exposure. So narrow to a specific question, are teens affected, to, affected by violent media? And narrow it further, is there any evidence that violent video games increase violence in the teens? So this is how you gradually come down from a broad topic to a more specific doable research so orthopedics let us say this very common example 
in my outpatient department, I notice a rather unusual number of women under the age of 45 with advanced osteoarthritis of the knee. They look physiologically older, many are overweight, and they all have various alignment with few exceptions. I ask myself, is there a possible cause-effect relationship in the evidence of this OA in such young patients? So you are thinking, you started thinking. So you look into your resources. I check my OPD statistics and check with my colleagues. And they see about 10 patients of this type in a span of about six months in each unit. At least half get advised TKA and not all undergo TKA. And if you're working in an institute where you have say six units, you know the approximate number you're going to see in the next six months. These are rough stats, not accurate, but a guideline on telling you about the magnitude of the problem which exists. I have a postgraduate coming in one month who needs a short research for lifting no more than two years. You cannot do long-term longitudinal studies, you cannot follow these ladies for maybe next 25 years. And you need a narrower problem which can be addressed by this particular postgraduate student who is going to be there with you for two years. So we'll do a literature search and my questions, we define the problem going a little back. What is the frontal plane, tibiofemoral plane alignment, the patients presenting with mechanical knee pain in a population presenting to a tertiary hospital in my institute? Is there a constitutional virus that predisposes to early knee pain and early degenerative arthritis? And maybe there could be certain secondary questions coming out when you collect the data, like what is the BMI and the incidence of diabetes in this population. So you are gradually developing a hypothesis. You feel there is no abnormality in the frontal, frontal plane to be femoral alignment in the patients presenting with mechanical knee pain and early OA in population of patients in South India. And there is no correlation between BMI and early osteoarthritic pain in the study population. So you start with this hypothesis and try to either prove it or disprove it by collecting your data in your subsequent research. So the research question, the why and the what, what is the problem I want to study? The domain, the subject, the population of the sample. Like in orthopedics, you want to study osteoarthritis knee and the subjects are 45 year old female in a population who presents to a clinic for knee pain and you want to correlate whether there is any correlation with the frontal plane tibial alignment. Why do I want to do the study and why do you want to study this problem? You do some literature review, you look at your sample population and you try to find out what is the lacuna in understanding. There might be a new lacuna about such a problem in your particular area but this might have been reported in certain other populations. So maybe you need to apply knowledge and derive certain conclusions for your population. Curiosity to understand a newer dimension to the issue. Why is it happening with our patients who are 45? Why is it that hip OA is more common in the Western world and knee OA is more common with your population? So it is important for us to isolate and define a scientific problem. For that, there needs to be interest. Increase in knowledge expected from the study is very important. That, that is the main basis for interest. If it is a problem which is not expected to improve the ultimate outcome of the patients coming to the clinic, it doesn't interest neither you nor the population. So this research would not be so important. The research should not be very easy. It said that low hanging fruits do not uh, give much gains, but it should not be very, very difficult problem, a complex problem. Probably only it can give you solutions in a long term. Rank by the amount in which they increase verifiable knowledge. So your problem should not be very simple, it should not be very difficult. And it should be a problem which increases the knowledge regarding 
a particular condition which presents to you very frequently and there is a knowledge gap from the same in the available literature. Feasibility. Now this is one of the pivotal things which is important in defining your research mission. Whether the problem is hard or easy. The units of time of completion, the example I had given was a postgraduate student who needs to complete his study in two years. Dependent on skills of the researcher and the resources available for the study, there has to be a match between these two. What looks easy on paper is often hard to execute and what's hard on paper can turn out virtually impossible. This comes out of experience of uh, doing research that something which is actually easy, like for example in this study, plan to calculate the BMI and you just forgot that you need to take the weight and the height of the patient which was not available in your clinic to begin with. And these two factors itself would become challenging at the end of the day because you need the equipment for it, you need somebody to do it and then, then you need somebody to record it for you to later to be available to calculate it for the speech. So that is why this sentence comes in that in a research what looks easy might not be very easy on paper and definitely anything which is hard will never happen. So you need both things, it needs to be interesting, that means at the end of the day they should have significant contribution to knowledge to improve healthcare and feasible. The time available and the resource available both need to be balanced so that the research can be completed in good time. So how about defining a scientific problem? The level of capability. Are you dealing with an undergraduate student? You need an easy and a short time subject for it. You need some confidence built in the age group because they are very, very new to research. Is it a graduate student or a postgraduate student, a research part time or a full time researcher? The capabilities, the focus, the desire, the thought process in each age group, in each type of researcher is going to be different. So if you don't match this with your question, the end results are not going to be true. So why do we need a research question? It's very important. It maintains a direction for the research. It maintains a focus of the principal investigator as well as the people attached to that research. If you, if you keep coming back to the research question and looking at your aims and objectives and your methodologies front and back more frequently, you remain focused and you are not diverted or deviated by your secondary outcomes and your secondary questions. You need to have tangible objectives. It helps you in motivating the team and continuing the research and it, it defines a sense of purpose which is actually derived from the problem which at hand which you are ultimately going to solve from the research question. So unless you have a research question in the beginning, you will not have an answer which is going to add new knowledge to literature and if that doesn't happen, it is not going to get published and it is not going to change your practices in delivering health. So it becomes a wasteful exercise. So it is very important for these many reasons that you have a research question to start with. So now what are the attributes to a research question? It has to be clear. It needs to be easy to understand. If it is too complicated or too much of uh, complex English in it or thought process into it, it defeats the process of having a question in the paper. It needs to be focused, narrow enough to be answered thoroughly, but not so narrow that it has only a predictable answer or maybe only a yes or no, because that doesn't remain a research thing. It needs to be concise. It needs to be expressed in few words. The research question cannot be a full page or three paragraphs. It needs to be a clear, focused, concise, Question. It should not be answerable in a simple or yes or no, but requires a particular methodology, 
to explain the path to the con conclusion. Because otherwise, it, it's like if you switch off the light, uh, it will become dark. So you don't have to do a research to it. And once you've done the research, you uh, you've tabulated your results, you are looking into it. There need there needs to be some debate left even after you've completed the research, meaning that your your outcomes should, should, should still be arguable. They should be open to a debate or a rebuttal. They should be either comparable to the literature already published, or if they are different, you need to come out with what is the hypothesis, why are they different? Because unless a research ends up with an open debatable conclusion, it is an end of a research. So if a, it is always you've seen this when you do research, while doing the research, we come across that probably if this was added or this was deleted from the methodology, it could have been more meaningful. So as you do your research, you end your research, you start writing your discussion. One of the important parts of the discussion is what was the lacuna in the current research? What was it which would make it more meaningful or what what is it which comes out of the results which tells you that probably you need to take this research on these lines further and probably get out some more answers so your attributes of a research questionnaire are that they need to be clear focused concise complex to a limit that they don't answer in a yes or no and they need to be arguable at the end of the the process of finding a journal question, choose an interesting journal topic. You should not be thinking about uh, mutation in bone tumors when you're working in a setup which deals with trauma patients. There has to be some preliminary research, which the major part of it is actually in literature review and probably looking into your own data of your institute which gives you an insight about the problem, the volume of the problem, magnitude of the problem. You evaluate a question again and again, and on, on, on that, that basis, you formulate a hypothesis. The process of finding a journal question or research question should not be a hasty process. In my practice, I am actually formulating a research question halfway through when doing a research. For example, if I am doing a research, maybe for a fracture establum, based on uh, 3D printed models, I am doing research, the challenges which you face, the new question which come up, start making the basis of the next research. So it should be a gradual process. At the end of one thesis, I ask my question, my postgraduate question, that what are the questions do you think which are coming out of your research? You got out some answers, but there would be something which are unanswered or if, if addressed in a different way, give you a better answer. So I, I find a research code which actually produces one or two new questions. So once these new questions are formulated, they are open up in the unit as soon as a new postgraduate comes in and you go through this grill of doing a preliminary research. We start asking questions on the on the lip, lip gap. Discuss you gradually formulate your hypothesis. Oh, research for question formulation. Primary question, there will be secondary questions coming in. Like for example, in this case, uh, we were talking about about the BMI, but be careful, you should not have a multitude of secondary questions because they will at the end of the, the day confuse you from your primary focus. So some mnemonics, this is an excellent mnemonic which is called FINAL regarding a research question. So each word has a meaning, F is for feasible, I is for interesting, N is for novel, E is for ethical and R is for relevant, and we actually added another meaning of R, 
that it needs to be reproducible. So we've talked about already about the feasibility, adequate number of subjects, adequate, adequate technical expertise, affordable in time and money, manageable in the scope of the institute. These, these feasibilities need to be checked. It's not a bad idea to do a few pilot cases before taking on the, the research straight away. It needs to be interesting, getting the answer is of interest to investigators, to the peers, and at large to the community, because they are going to get benefited at the end of the day. It needs to be novel, confirms, refutes, or extends previous findings. Not, it might not be a new discovery, but there needs to be some novelty attached to a research question. Of course, it needs to be ethical. Patient safety is a priority in all type of research and relevant to scientific knowledge, clinical and of public health and to future research. So these are the, part of the characters of a good uh, research question. There is another formula which is uh, kept in the mind while framing a research question, which is also used in other parts of a research methodology, which is ECOT. P being population, population of interest for the patient population to be at risk. In our example, it was 45-year-old females who were coming with knee pain and were of early osteoarthritis. The intervention or the exposure or the treatment or the test we are going to do. In our case, probably we are going to look at their tibiofemoral frontal plane angles and look at their association with the severity of osteoarthritis. The control, the standard of care in a particular disease, or a normal population in a particular disease, comparative population, or an intervention. So now, this might not be always there in all type of studies. When you get to the next few lectures on research methodology, you will understand that a control may or may not be there, depending upon what study design you're using, and the outcome of interest. You are always looking at a parameter uh, which you want to research. And there have to be timelines, as I told you, depending upon whether it is a thesis, whether it is a PhD dissertation, or whether it is an investigative research. There are timelines attached to them, and if you have them from day one, your efforts would be most focused. So these are the various resources which I have used to frame this talk, and some of our experience, which I've gained over the years to share with you what could be the method of getting a research question. So a research question should drive you to the research design. As I've told you, research question is always born through a practical problem in your clinical practice. It should not be an outcome of a dream which should take a week sitting in a library. It's connected to the ground, it's connected to a practical problem, motivates an appropriate research question which ultimately defines the research problem and creates the research design which helps you in finding the answer and helps to solve the practical problem you started with. So thank you very much uh, for patient listening. I hope uh, this small talk helps you somehow scientifically guide you on framing a research question and this is an invite and a welcome from Indian Orthopedic Association to the Journal, Indian Journal of Orthopedics to send your research and we are more than happy to have a look and publish it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just a query from my side. Uh, do you give your students the questions directly or ask them to search for the questions? So there can be two approaches. No. In my practice, I don't give them a question. Uh, I give them an area of uh, interest okay. for fracture establum. And then I leave them in my unit for a month or so where they observe what's going on, what protocols mm -hmm. we are following. And okay. then during the discussions, issues come out that probably these are the two, three areas we are contemplating on changing. And that is how gradually the research question builds up. Okay. All right. So, 
I'll stop the lecture there and maybe Praveen can share his uh, PowerPoint. Uh, meanwhile, Raju, sir, sir, I wanted to ask you, like uh, many sir said that uh, his protocol about giving new topics to students, yes. how do you give new topics to students? Again, same thing. Uh, you define an area of research, mm -hmm. but specific uh, aspect of research has to be developed by looking into the literature. You see, uh, my theory is very simple that I've been in practice for last 35 years. And if I think that something which I have not read or come across and which I'm seeing now uh, must be rare, and that has to be then uh, seen in the li existing literature. If there are uh, very little information or if there are knowledge gaps, uh, that may be a very good area to dwell into doing research. So that only comes when you define a particular area of interest and then go into the literature and see what is available and what you can do. Right. So Dr. Praveen, you can share your things, your PPT. Uh, yeah, I was trying just one second. Sorry, I think I forgot. Um, you have to open your PowerPoint and... Yeah, I've done that. But last time I got a link. Just open the PowerPoint, come back to the video panel panel where we are and there is a yeah. green tab for share screen. Uh, another question to you, Raju sir. Have you yeah. continued a student's thesis to the next batch anytime? Or your students' thesis has generated more questions and you are given those questions as new thesis to the next batch? Something like oh, that. Do you mean continuation of the same work? Yes. Uh, you see, it is very difficult to do a longitudinal study because of the problems of uh, uh, having patients coming for follow-up and so on. Uh, especially, I am in the private practice, so it is often difficult. So, each student mostly have uh, a new topic, but uh, because students come and go, but we uh, as a clinician uh, uh, sometimes do follow up these patients on longer term as a continuation of the study. Right, right. Okay. But that is not very frequent. Quite well. Unfortunately not. Yeah. Okay, Praveen, you can go ahead with your talk. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. So uh, that was a very exhaustive presentation uh, from Dr. Maini. And uh, I've just added a, a couple of uh, different points, uh, more uh, coming from a different perspective. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will add on to and reinforce some of the points that Dr. Maini has made. So when we look off, uh, when we, when a PG enters uh, uh, the system, the unit, what is the PG's perspective? Uh, okay, so I want to be a great surgeon in three years. That's obviously what goes through the first thing in the mind. Dissertation is a necessary evil. It has to be done without which I can't become a surgeon. So what do I do next? To get over this necessary evil, I have to find a topic. that will take the least time to complete. And of course, the results have to be favorable. And the boss already knows what's the result. Sorry, this is in a light of wind. <laughs> so, so this is the PG's perspective when, when a PG is entering the unit. And what's the supervisor's perspective? How am I supposed to come up with a new topic every six months for all these newbies who come through the door? Like others, their priority is only to concentrate on uh, getting the hands-on work. And uh, he has zero experience in research. Uh, most doctors who enter the postgraduate program do not have much experience in our system in research or even audits. And again, you know, I have a busy job. Do I have enough time to fit all this in with my busy schedule for clinical practice? So this is what I might do as a supervisor. Okay, I'll give you some more information. Choose a topic yourself. So now coming to the crux of the talk, who should choose the research question? 
so i think it has to be a combination of things as dr many rightly said he gives the pgs a broad direction but ultimately it's the individual's interest that should guide what is the topic of research and here i'm going to expand uh, out of our postgraduate program i'm talking to you know, even uh, the the ms post ms doctors and uh, you know everybody should be taking some interest in research but fundamentally you have to be interested in research um supervisor can guide but they will not impose a topic on you and for a beginner a more general topic is better because it's easier to grasp so yeah somebody might come up with uh, some very fancy idea it's equally important as dr manny again said in his talk that the topic should be very relevant it has to be of the larger interest to the department and to the community and uh, one should have the relevant resources uh, to do a particular piece of research so the second point in the methodology for choosing a research question is you have to do some preliminary research so you get a broad idea of what you want to do but then you go for a literature search nowadays uh, with the advent of internet you can pretty much access everything under the sun that you want and there are so many resources some of which i have listed in my presentation here and um, people can go to the library access the previous uh, thesis that has been submitted to the university and then again discussion with colleagues and supervisors is is always uh, useful so consider the audience this is probably not as relevant in the current context because we are talking to an audience of orthopedic surgeons so i'll skip that one and then consider the time again as dr many said if uh, the research has to be submitted within two or three years then you should choose a project accordingly that you are able to finish it in the allotted time if not a succession succession plan should be in place so that you know when you have finished your pg or when you move on to a different job maybe after having started this as an assistant professor somebody else is able to take over the project and finish it for you the next thing is the funding and the compliance so funding can be from various sources it can be from the institute at the government level ngos or even mm -hmm. at the industry level Uh, and more importantly compliance these days so if you are going for uh, basic science projects going for randomized control trials there is a whole new set of compliance that has that has to be dealt with so you need to be familiar with that and be able to comply with that and, and again it's not necessarily the first step in the process uh, choosing the question again i think dr many mentioned this as well that uh, many a times uh, we will identify the research question start doing literature search digging deeper and then you realize that actually new questions are coming out as you dig deeper into the topic and this might alter uh, the hypothesis slightly and you might have to revisit that to to rephrase the question so what are the attributes of an ideal research question it has to be specific it has to be focused and it should also interest others it should be topical so for example in in today's day and age uh, we probably may not be talking of a research topic that was you know uh, done 50 60 years ago so it has to be topical it should we should be able to complete the project within the allocated resources and there should not be too many subordinate or follow up questions so like whilst it is understood that uh, every research hypothesis every question will generate some questions that is the nature of science and research but if it throws up 10 to 20 questions then probably it will confuse the whole issue so ideally they sh should not have more than 3 maximum 5 um, follow up questions from the research question thank you very much thank you very much uh, pravin uh, I, so i think most of the basic concept about uh, research question has been cleared by both the talks and even the methodology step wise how to go about i just had one question to all the panelists maybe we can start with uh, dr vaish what is the commonest yeah. mistake you have uh, seen students doing while selecting a topic um you know when they are asked to select the topic they are yeah. very fresh and they do not know what to do and if the their mentor uh, is not supporting them they just pick up a topic based on previous work which has been done 
in the hope that they can copy and you know uh, do the same work uh, later on which is not correct so i think it's the duty of the supervisor or mentor to guide them and they have to be very specific as it has been stressed by both the uh, speakers before uh, about the research topic uh, if you uh, for example if you are doing any research on knee osteoarthritis so you need not to cover the whole all aspects of knee osteoarthritis you have to be very focused what do you want to uh, in knee osteoarthritis which particular aspect of knee osteoarthritis you want to study in your thesis so your primary question must be very solid secondary questions if they develop should not yeah. be more you should be sticking to the point most of the time even while writing your thesis or paper suppose if you are discussing why knee osteoarthritis is common in my population in young people you need not to dwell lot of uh, that how what is knee osteoarthritis what is the pathophysiology and you know what are the other treatments available you have to focus on your primary question and second thing is when you are sending it for publication two questions must be in your mind why my paper should be published in a journal why should they publish it because if there are a lot of work already been done on the same topic you are not adding any new knowledge to the literature and to be rejected and if you think for a example if you have uh, that uh, i have got a very unique case cases have been published before so why a journal should publish the 21st case on the same topic because you are not again contributing any new novel thing in that uh, case report neither the knowledge no uh, uh, new diagnostic uh, methods or no treatment methods so all these things have to be uh, thoroughly uh, considered in your mind before you do any research or try to do publication out of it all right uh, any opinion about that dr uh, pravin yeah sorry yeah, it was the question for you but if you want to finish off yeah it, yeah sure sure Uh, we can just finish off this point on common mistakes that students do then we can have the question yeah yeah so sindra go ahead you... yeah so no i was just asking uh, in your experience what do you think are the steps that can be taken to inculcate this culture of uh, audit and research in our post graduates i think most important is the interest of the mentors like sir said that is the most important mm. point because undergraduate level we mm. hardly have any research education yeah. even at post graduate level research is like a sideline actually part of... un... yes sir yes sir sham can i interrupt until yes, very rec- until very recently both the supervisors or mentors and students were not interested in doing any research because it was just an obligation which has to be fulfilled in right. achieving your masters degree you both parties were doing that but now since it is mandatory for the supervisors to have good publications 3 to 5 or whatever for their next promotion uh, they have become more serious that's my observation in last few years and we, that's why we are getting a lot of uh, the good thesis is and papers coming out of these thesis that's right that's right so we are looking for the people who are getting good papers yeah sasindra go ahead yeah um with respect to uh, education or research especially in the pg uh, period or even later i think there has to be clear allotment of roles okay as a post graduate trainee i mean we don't expect him to do a lot of things other than uh, coordinating a, a patient a uh, patient for the treatment or collecting the data and all that and there has to be clear allotment of roles as to who is uh, recruiting the patient if there is a randomization if there is a treatment execution sometimes what happens uh, we start up with a single surgeon study it lands up because of lack of coordination that it lands up to be multi surgeon study or uh, 
um, there is an uh, incoordination between uh, postgraduates. Sometimes what happens, a uh, postgraduate is not available on a particular day and uh, when the study protocol says that every consecutive patient with so and so problem is to be recruited, it doesn't happen because just because of non-availability of a postgraduate on a particular day. So there has to be clear allotment of roles and there has to be a backup plan at every step of the study. For example, recruitment of patients. So there has to be a backup plan. If the postgraduate is not available, there has to be an alternate postgraduate or an alternate surgeon who is doing those. I mean, who will be able to back up for the study? Or uh, the to treatment also, there has to be a backup plan. If a surgeon, I mean, single surgeon based study, there has to be a backup plan of and getting the study done, I mean, surgery done electively later, on a later date, if the surgeon is not, or there has to be a prior uh, planning during the protocol stage as to who will be able to proceed with the surgery when the surgeon is not available. Right, right. Now, these are the problems faced when we start to do research. Right now, we are yeah, only on research question. question. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, your okay. opinion, Dr. Rohit, what are the problems we face in research questions? See, the problem is sometimes the supervisor who's giving you the research question is only doing it because he's he wants to un get an answer to a problem he has been thinking about for a few years. And, right. uh, and he gives to a trainee who's just joined orthopedics has no knowledge. I think the key bit is a background uh, work on uh, literature search needs to be done because the answer might be there in the literature, which uh, candidate or the supervisor hasn't looked into. And they do all three years of research and then come up with an answer or a thesis, which is not publishable. So I think the key bit there is that we, when we submit the proposal, the proposal needs to be checked in a similar way as a thesis or maybe as a, a research paper is checked so that the candidate who's spending two, three years in doing that uh, dissertation will have, uh, have a publication at the end of it. Absolutely correct. So Manny sir has joined us live. Good evening, sir. Hi. So we were discussing about uh, uh, what are the problems uh, we have seen, errors that students have made while selecting a research topic. So I totally agree with Rohit that <clears throat> lack of literature review or insufficient literature review is one of the most commonest problem that I've seen. Even if they're given a topic or when they select a topic, they review the literature incomplete or just superficially and then come up with a topic and try to negotiate with it. Like I said, just find an earlier topic and then go ahead with it. So that's, that's a very most common error that I could think of and absolutely correct. Yeah, Lalitha, you want to say something about this point? I know uh, regarding the postgraduate student, uh, the most important thing about research question, I think they should spend time on getting it on. Right. It invariably happens for DNB students, the day he joins, he knows the day of submission of the protocol. And even an MS author uh, student knows when the protocol is to be submitted. But they don't get on to the race till it's maybe 10 days left and then it's a lost battle from day one. So I think a very important uh, part is to build a question over some time, take at least maybe four to six weeks on uh, understanding what area and then narrowing down on what specific part of that area and then looking into the literature. Why this happened, this cut paste and hush hush in the literature search, they're, um, they're not left with much time. Right. So, we need to inculcate this uh, habit of uh, not waiting till the last date and uh, getting on with this process because this is the most important part, I suppose. If you start well, you will end uh, in a proper place. If the start is a very, very uh, shabby one, uh, it, will, it will create a lot of problems at home. That's right, sir. That's right. So I think we are to the conclusion that formulating the research question and building the background or building the foundation for the research question is one of the most important points that we can do. And we have to give time to that and do it thoroughly. If we can, if we manage to do it thoroughly, our rest of the project will also be as strong as the question as well as other, our review. So I think that was a very good message at the end of this uh, uh, first IGO on air uh, webinar. Uh, 
any of the panelists wants to add any other point, they're welcome to add. Now uh, we can end with that note on this. Thank you very much. It was a very Thank good you. session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir.